we are getting very close to the time when we will go live with uh, TEDx Binnenhof and um, to hear the words of our Prime Minister. His topic this morning at, will be creating sustainable happiness. And so this morning, our speakers have touched a little bit on the different facets and aspects of what sustainable happiness can mean for us here in Aruba. And so we will have panel discussions after we actually hear the Prime Minister speak this morning. Today, our hearts were moved by the brilliance of the mind and by the dedication of these great speakers, these great persons, because it's not only intelligence, but you also have to have the soul to decide to dedicate such brilliance towards the benefit of mankind. So. The big question is, for the future, is what governments, what companies, what institutions will do with these great ideas? Who will embrace them? Who will work with them so that these ideas can become reality? It's that what I would like to share with you, that we are doing on this very small island with people like I've shared today during a whole session of thinking and collab collaborating on the future of mankind. Aruba has in its vegetation an important symbol of sustainability. We are a very dry island. Almost nothing grows in Aruba. But within this arid soil, we have a very special tree. We call it the DVDV tree, although most will discuss on the different names it has, but for today, we call it the DVDV tree. The DVDV tree teaches us an important lesson of life and survival. It is a tree that although it has to live in all this drought, survives and flourishes. It survives and flourishes because it works with the forces of nature. And for us, that is the example, and that is the message that we should take along in all our decisions when we have to set priorities as a country, as a company, as an institution. Aruba is an island that knew a development that was in the beginning of the 80s, very slow. We had a refinery and we had a small tourism industry. Middle in the 80s, suddenly the oil refinery of Aruba closed. We lost suddenly 50% of government income. We had a staggering unemployment of 35%. Political leaders at that time came up with a rescue plan. They decided that in the tourism industry, there was an untapped potential for Aruba to recover from this crisis. So they set out a plan to double up the hotel rooms in Aruba, create jobs, and spur the economy. They were very successful, as you can see from the picture left and right. We went from 2000 hotel rooms to more than 8,000 hotel rooms in the last 25 years. We went from 200,000 tourists to a million and a half tourists. Our GDP growth reached a staggering amount of $2.9 billion, $2 billion compared with $400 million when we started. And it was indeed an amazing development. Our island's population grew from 60,000 to 105,000 as it is today. However, it is important 
that after 25 years of an island development, but any country's development, that you take stock. Take your social economic models as well as your political models and put them in the bright light of a new day and examine them and ask critical questions. Does it really serve the next generation? Can it be changed? Can we improve on the model so that it would be better for the next generation? And that's exactly what my generation, what I did, examine the growth model of Aruba. And I came to the same conclusion as a very important political leader in the 60s came in the United States, Robert F. Kennedy. It was not popular, I believe, in the 60s when capitalism was really kind of the answer to everything in the United States for sure, to have a statement that says that GDP doesn't say the whole story of our society. It doesn't talk about the quality of the education of our children. It doesn't say nothing about the health of our families and their marriages, about the richness of our poem, of our wit, or of our intellect. It doesn't say anything about the level of our public debates or the integrity of our public officials. It says a lot except but what really makes life worthwhile. And we came to the conclusion that although we had reached these staggering numbers in GDP, that it was not translated into a well-being for every citizen in Aruba. Important economic growth naturally is important for every country. But it needs to be translated in a better quality of life for all the citizens living in that country. And we came to the conclusion that yes, we have five-star hotels, but we would like to have five-star schools for the education of our children. We would like to have five-star elderly homes. We would like to have five-star neighborhoods. We would like to have a five-star quality of life also for the citizen of our country. And based upon this reflection, we sat together in Aruba, and we introduced the first Dutch solution, the political one, social dialogue, polder model. All the employees' organizations were invited, the employers' organizations were invited to sit with government leaders, and we discussed the future of Aruba for the next 25, 50 years. And we came to the conclusion that we wanted sustainable prosperity. We wanted to have an economic model where also the progress and growth will be connected to well-being and happiness of our citizens. And in doing so, we determined what we have to do to guarantee that. And in Aruba, it was very clear. We had deteriorating cities, neighborhoods, and schools. We were losing the social cohesion that was so important to bring and hold a country together. So we set out a Bo Aruba plan, your Aruba plan, to renovate our cities, our landmarks, everything that what makes an island as Aruba beautiful. Our neighborhoods, we brought lights where there were no lights, we brought pavement where there were no pavement. Our Bo Barrio program, our neighborhood program, your neighborhood program, to build citizenship, to build social cohesion, get people together, believing in the future of the island and caring about their neighbors. And in all this projection towards the future, sustainability has also an important part in alternative energy. And we designed a plan to make Aruba totally sustainable by 2020. We were embraced by important partners, such as Carbon War Room of Richard Branson. And we started working on introduction of alternative energy and sustainable energy in Aruba. Very important for our environment, but not, also, not only for our environment, because we import 
so much oil that goes at the cost of what we can do for the education of our children and for all that live in Aruba. And by doing what we have been doing, we were able to reduce the amount of dollars spent to purchase heavy fuel oil for our utility companies by almost 50%, from 6,000 barrels a day to 3,000, 5,000 barrels a day by efficiency positions we have taken by introducing windmill farms in Aruba and solar parks that are in development at this moment. At this moment, 20% of the energy of Aruba is supplied by windmills. 5% will be added with the introduction of the largest solar park in the Caribbean, right in front of the airport, whoever ever went to Aruba. Uh, we have a huge parking lot right in front of the airport that will be totally covered with solar panels that will bring shade to the cars underneath and naturally produce another 5% of the total energy capacity of our country. And next year, we will be building the next windmill farm, which will bring Aruba to almost 50% of a total capacity in energy based on sustainable energy. For the next 50%, we will have an enormous challenge because introducing alternative energy in your grid system has as a challenge that you need to maintain the stability on the grid. For that reason, we are extremely happy that in this process we have important partners. We have Mr. Richard Branson and Carl Warum. We have TNO, we have Harvard, we have TU Delft working with us. How do you introduce more alternative energy in your total system and at the same time maintain the stability in your energy capacity for a whole country? At the same moment that we are doing this, we are also celebrating the fact that bringing all these institutions to Aruba is putting the foundation for a new economic pillar for Ireland one based on knowledge. Together with TNO and the other institutions already in Aruba, all the knowledge we are acquiring, all the policies that we are implementing are forming the basis for a new economic pillar where we'll be exporting this knowledge to the other areas in the world that are also interested to walk the same path as we are walking at this moment. We are very encouraged by the fact that being embraced not only by out-of-the-kingdom institutions such as Carbon War Room, but also institutions within the kingdom that bring these important solutions for global challenges. And lately, we have been working very closely with Mr. Wibo Ockels on the project of bringing the education of green to schools. And I definitely know I have a singer that will bring to Aruba to encourage and inspire our kids to think green for the future of Aruba. <laughs> These are only the first steps. In the next couple of days, when I go home tomorrow, in the afternoon, we will be signing a contract, a MOU with Philips. Philips will turn all the light points of Aruba into lead, and that conversion will not only be a great saving for energy in Aruba, but also will be the first country that has done this in an integral way that will also be showcased in Aruba, and we are very proud of that. KLM will be flying on the 16th of May with the first biodiesel flight to the Caribbean from Schiphol to Oranjestad, and we are very proud that together with a lot of Dutch institutions, we are making the point to the world that indeed, in the Netherlands, we have solutions for global challenges. My friends, <laughs> that boy with the curly ball, as they say in Dutch, with the curly hair, that is me. I'm sitting on the lap of my late father. Not many months after this picture was taken, he passed away. He was the most famous and loved political leader 
at that time. He was 10 years the opposition leader in Aruba. He won the election, and on the 1st of July, 1967, he formed his government. And on the 13th of July, 12 days after that, he suddenly passed away. He left behind a widow and eight children. And my father was a politician that dedicated his life to serving his people. So he didn't leave us with much other than a great heritage of serving community. And my mother had it difficult. The community of Aruba came together. They purchased a house for us. In the neighborhood where I went to live, everyone knew about the widow and the eight children. So the teacher, three houses further, gave free lessons to me after school. The boys next door, they were my friends from richer parents. When they bought sneakers for my friends, their mother would also buy sneakers for me. The headmaster of the school, when I left home to go to school, did not, did not arrive, as you could understand what I mean. He would call home and see what happened with me. That is the type of community I was raised in. And it's for that reason I believe I'm standing here. Because the choices that have to be made for a sustainable society, not only ecologically in the area of sustainable energy, but also social economically, is very important. And political leaders have to have the heart, have to have the soul to look at these great talents that presented ideas today that can save the earth, save the planet, save kids, save the future of humanity, and embrace them. And I would like you all to spread that word so we embrace these great ideas and these great innovators. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes TEDxVinov 2014.